again, I'm Ken Record, and I welcome you back to Mining Biblical Truth, where this week we delve into 2 Samuel chapters 19 and 20. So to review our caustic structure of this section of the consequences of David's sin, it goes from the revolt of Absalom to the revolt of Sheba from chapter 13 to chapter 20. We've been working our way through this, and now we come to David's return to Jerusalem and Sheba's revolt. David's mourning for Absalom demoralizes the troops, resulting in a stern rebuke by Joab, who rallies David to reclaim the hearts of the people. It's a repeat of the hearts theme that we saw earlier. David appeals to Judah to welcome him back, and their hearts were swayed. The rebellious northern tribes are offended that he did not ask all Israel to welcome him. However, he did appeal to Amasa to come back to him, and setting Amasa over Joab and Abishai. In, these, in this return, we see three parallel encounters to the uh, trip out, the escape. In, in the escape, the order was Hushai, the loyal Gentile, Seba, the servant of Saul, and then being cursed by Shimei. On the return, it's Shimei coming in humble repentance, Mephibosheth, Zeba's master coming, and Barzillai, the loyal Gentile. Shema repents and humbles himself before David and along with a thousand men of Benjamin. David has mercy on him, restraining the, the arm of Abishai. When you compare Joab and Abishai, both are bloodthirsty, but Abishai never kills without permission, whereas Joab repeatedly does so. And then Mephibosheth arrives, showing up looking haggard and refuting Ziba's accusations. David ends up giving him back half of Saul's possessions that he had given to Ziba, apparently unable to decide who was telling the truth. When Mephibosheth sees his relationship to David as more important than the possessions, David should have realized that he was telling the truth, much as Solomon does later in the story of the stolen child and dispute between two women when the true mother cared more about the life of the child. The other aspect of this is that when Solomon becomes king, he will have to deal with the men that David failed to punish, including Shimei and Joab. Then the faithful Gentile Barzillai appears again and transfers uh, David's offer of blessing to Chimham, presumably his son. Barzillai uses the same term used for Hushai, not to be a burden to David. Neither wishes to be a burden. And then Shimei takes advantage of the rift between the northern tribes and Judah, when he yells out, we have no portion in David, we have no inheritance in the son of Jesse, every man to his tents, O Israel. Now Joshua had warned about this in chapter 22, 27 of Joshua. He said, to be a witness between us and you, between our generations after us, that we do perform the service of the Lord in his presence with our burnt offerings and sacrifices and peace offerings, so your children will not slay our children in time to come, saying, you have no portion in the Lord. And then it appears the final time in 1 Kings chapter 12, when the northern tribes have their final rebellion against Rehoboam, son of Solomon. When all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king, what portion do we have in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. 
To your tents, O Israel, look now to your own house, David. So we see here that the uh, rivals, rivalries that began among da Jacob's sons were never fully healed. Like a smoldering infection, it erupts over and over until it finally er kills its host. And then Amasa fails the leadership test. David promotes Abishai, snubbing Joab again. And Joab kills Amasa and takes over the army in the same manner as he had killed Abner and Absalom. Basically, he says, you think you can take my position? You better think again when you deliver Joab. And in the final scene, we see echoes of Abimelech again. Previously, Joab had alluded to David as acting like Abimelech. Now Sheba, who would seize uh, power like Abimelech, is executed at a wall by a woman cutting off his head. This is a reference to Judges chapter 9. In literally parallelism, by the author, the woman of Tekoa is involved in the resurrection of the rebel Absalom, and a woman is involved in the death of the rebel Sheba. So women open and close the narrative. And then comparing 2 Samuel 8, where David's power structure is displayed to, to the end of chapter 20, note who is missing or added. In chapter 8, it says David reigns over all, but in chapter 20, reference to David is completely missing. Instead, Joab over the army is listed first. Joab's the one with the real power here. And then Zadok over the priests versus Zadok and Abithar over the priests, and Benaiah over the palace guard is the same in both. And then in chapter 8, we have sons of David as chief ministers. Now they're no longer listed. It's like they, they've lost power. And there's an addition here that's interesting where it says Adoram over forced labor. Now the beginning of David's reign, there's no mention of forced labor. And forced labor would become a big issue under the reign of Solomon where he would expand this greatly and enslave the people. So rebellions that go against God's will and against his anointed ultimately fail. What evil ruling against God's will today is destined to fail? And what form of rebellion by us is also destined to fail? Lord, thank you for these scriptures and the warnings uh, involved against rebelling against you. Thank you that you have redeemed us uh, through Christ and given us our sins. Uh, help us uh, to live uh, in submission uh, to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thanks for watching. Next week, we'll wrap things up with uh, the final on the epilogue chapters of Second Samuel. Have a blessed week. Thank you.